Uh, as we convene uh, this briefing on uh, the future of Libya, as I said, the country, uh, most of you know, continues to have two competing uh, governments uh, claiming executive authority, the government of uh, national accord known as the GNA, GNA for brief, based in Tripoli, uh, which is recognized by the international community and uh, headed by Faiz, uh, Prime Minister Faiz Sarraj. And then we have the interim government, uh, going back to March uh, 2014, headed by Prime Minister Abdullah Al Thani, uh, which operates in the country's eastern uh, uh, provinces, along with, of course, its own elected uh, parliament and supported by the Libyan uh, National Army under the command of uh, Khalifa Haftar. Uh, the two warring factions, uh, as we have witnessed over, over the past few months in particular, uh, are currently uh, involved in battles along the outskirts of uh, Tripoli. Actually, some of uh, our speakers have witnessed uh, the beginning of, of that and will be discussing uh, some of that uh, development with you. Over the past uh, month or so, actually 42 days to be precise, uh, the Eastern uh, Libyan National Army has continued its uh, rapid advances across the south seizing control of several towns and many oil fields uh, previously controlled uh, by independent uh, competing militias. Meanwhile, uh, as Libya's two major rival governments continue vying for power in the north, uh, the so-called Islamic State uh, continues uh, to exist and to function, uh, particularly in the southern uh, tip or part uh, of the country. Uh, all this, uh, according to various humanitarian agencies, have also triggered uh, some significant, significant displacement of, uh, of civilians, adding to the misery uh, that we have seen for several years, uh, the heavy price uh, that the civilian uh, Libyan population has paid as a result uh, of, of this conflict. In, in the recent development alone, uh, I was looking at some statistics today, almost 70,000 uh, basically displaced persons uh, have uh, been tallied uh, just in, in the last 40 uh, days, uh, going back to the early phase of the clashes uh, in early April. Now, in terms of recent developments, uh, this conflict uh, has not been dormant or static. Uh, a lot of developments almost every day. Uh, today, for example, er earlier today, the Russian Deputy Foreign Minister, Mikhail Bogdanov, and French Special Envoy for Libya, uh, Frederic Desagneau, uh, have discussed the situation uh, in Libya uh, during a meeting uh, earlier, as I said. Uh, and according to the uh, uh, Russian Foreign Ministry, a statement issued by the ministry said, uh, during, uh, during a detailed discussion, the diplomats have touched upon the current situation in Libya with special attention paid to the importance of putting an end uh, to armed confrontation and establishing a stable inter-Libyan national dialogue in the interest of ending the prolonged crisis in the country. Uh, good statement, but the conflict is, is, is continuing. So uh, the Russian side, according to the statements, has reaffirmed its unwavering commitment to promote uh, the political process in Libya uh, with the end goal of establishing uh, united bodies of power uh, able to resolve uh, the current issues uh, in an effective manner, including uh, the fight against terrorism and extremist uh, ideology, end of quote. Uh, last Monday, uh, on the 13th uh, of, of May, the NATO Secretary General, uh, Stoltenberg, uh, met with UN Secretary General Special Envoy for Libya, Ghassan Salami, uh, expressing uh, concern uh, on behalf of the alliance over the deteriorating situation in Libya and called for, again, uh, an end to the fighting. He appealed to all the parties in, in Libya to rejoin the political process. Uh, Salami added and uh, reiterated at that meeting that there is no military solution to the current crisis in Libya. A few words that ended up causing a big uh, complaint uh, from uh, one side, at least, of the Libyan uh, equation, the Haftar side, uh, in terms of uh, limiting, I guess, uh, their maneuverability by uh, saying that there is no military solution. Uh, to the current crisis in Libya. All this uh, happened, of course, in the aftermath of uh, another major statement uh, back on uh, April 19th that uh, we all uh, heard 
uh, from the White House acknowledging that uh, President Trump spoke by phone that week with Libyan commander uh, Khalifa Haftar and discussed with him uh, ongoing counterterrorism efforts, uh, which is kind of, I'm, I'm quoting, by the way, I don't know what ongoing counterterrorism efforts uh, in this regard are. But at any rate, I think these developments definitely raise some serious questions for us uh, to uh, discuss today. And uh, our speakers, uh, we have, uh, staff have coordinated with our speakers, a division of labor, uh, kind of focusing around these questions that I'm going uh, to present to you at this moment to refresh uh, the minds of our speakers and to give you an idea what the general kind of parameters of our discussions uh, today would be. First, where is the Libyan crisis heading? Two, will Libyans ever overcome internal <coughs> political rivalries or are they destined to self-destruct with these continuing differences and, and civil war, if you could call it civil? Is the UN mediation under Ghassan Salami and the whole diplomatic process, as a matter of fact, still a credible process? Is it still potentially promising to produce some results? Four, what is the political significance and impact of the Trump Haftar phone call? Does it really constitute a change in US policy towards Libya? And maybe what is that policy anyway? Uh, is the GNA number five equipped and capable of withstanding the onslaught by the LNA uh, that seems to have stopped at this point uh, south of the city of uh, Tripoli? What about the European dimension? Can Europe r really reconcile its competing agendas uh, in Libya and work together uh, to indeed uh, put an end to the fighting there and, and, and uh, help the parties, the Libyan parties, uh, to uh, better endeavor uh, in the future? Has the conflict in Libya been Lebanonized with competing Arab and Middle East agenda? Uh, particularly when we look at the, the, the number of countries on the, on the Arab side, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, uh, Qatar, and other Middle Eastern countries like Turkey, so heavily involved uh, in, 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 in this conflict. Uh, will that allow uh, for a, a peaceful, uh, uh, let's say, a resolution uh, or process to emerge uh, under these circumstances? And finally, is regional influence destined to impede a political resolution uh, to this crisis? So with these questions in mind, uh, we have invited today a very distinguished uh, panel. Uh, they will speak in the order uh, that I will be uh, introducing them. I will not go through all their bios to give them a little bit more time uh, to make their presentations, but we will begin with our friend uh, Karim Mizran, who is director and uh, resident senior fellow North Africa Initiative at the Atlantic Council. And then we will move to Najla El Mangouche, uh, who is a graduate lecturer at George Mason University, uh, where she serves as also an adjunct faculty at uh, NOVA, Northern Virginia Community College, sorry. Uh, Christian uh, Coates Erickson uh, uh, is non-resident senior fellow uh, at Rice University uh, and also at the Baker Institute there and also affiliated as non-resident senior fellow with Arab Center uh, here in Washington. And uh, last but not least, our friend uh, uh, from Italy directly uh, on Skype will be joining us also in a few minutes to discuss particularly the uh, European, if you will, uh, interaction with, the, with this conflict is uh, Federica Saini Fazanotti, and uh, who is affiliated with the Brookings Institution and also a senior research fellow at the Italian Institute for International Political Studies. Thank you all for being here. And uh, we will begin with the presentation by Karim Mizran. Thank you very much, Khalil. And thanks to the Arab Center for this invitation and this important occasion to talk about Libya. <coughs> Once again, Libya is in the eye of the hurricane because of this attack by Haftar that brought the country back quite, quite quite a few years. This attack has been uh, always in Tripoli when this happened and really su surprised everybody, especially in the, in, in the international actor, international community. Uh, we had expression of surprise from the European Union, from, but, 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 but even from Cairo and from Abu Dhabi. At the beginning, there was something like, 
what, what the hell is going on? Which is what surprised me. This surprise surprised me because I said, Hafter has been very linear, has been very clear, has been transparent. Since the beginning, he always made clear that he was not interested in the, in the, in the, in the, in the negotiation. He made it clear from his body language, from, from the interviews he released. I remember interviews to the Correa della Sera, to the Italian Repubblica, to, to Le Monde. He said, there is time for peace and talks, and there is time for war. And this is the time to, to get the weapons. And, uh, or he said, I am, the, my intention is to liberate the country. My intention is to defeat terrorists. And for him, terrorists and anybody who, dis who dissents from him are the same thing. So this, 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 this policy was, was up there, was, was very clear. So what was to be, to be uh, su su surprised about? The timing was also important to notice, because when Salame started introducing the idea of a convention, the idea of a national conference, national, however, however you want to call it, where a lot of these issues w w would, were supposed to, 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 to be resolved, created a big problem for Hafter. Because he, his position has always been, I am ready to negotiate, but what I want is to head the army, to be the leader of the army. That was his apparent request. Because he knew that it was not acceptable to the other part. Therefore, he said, we, we, we can drag it along while I, I'm arming, while I'm, I'm, I'm getting my troops ready, while I'm getting my resources in place. Once Salame worked it out with Serraj and, and, and the other actors, that at the conference, Haftar would have been given what he asked for, because he was supposed to emerge from the conference as the head of the army. OK, within a National Security Council, he would have been a primus inter pares, would have been the first among equals. But still, he would have had what he asked for. He realized that if he entered that conference, if he accepted that point, it would be, it would, it would, it would be done for him. There would be no way for him to be the leader of the country or to ascend unless he would go for election, and he can't, and so on. So he tried. And, and on this, I, I, I believe the, the version of Abu Dhabi and Cairo, that they didn't did, did really know. I, uh, I have the feeling that he pulled their, their, their jacket in the sense that he, he thought that if he moved into Tripoli very quickly, very rapidly, he had information from, 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 from some of his people in Tripoli that there was a big constituent for, of support for him, that some of the militias, the Madhari's, the head of the review would support it, would affect for him. He, he thought he could make it. He thought, I get in, these militias come on my side, I occupy the city, I will present a fait accompli to the international community. What are they going to do? They're they going to support me. They're not going to, to attack me or do anything. So that was his plan. He tried, but it, but it, it didn't work out the way he wanted to, because the militias did not defect. They actually fought. A lot of his soldiers were ambushed. I was surprised to see all the interviews on, 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 on YouTube and Facebook of the soldiers that they were captured, hundreds of them. And most of the soldiers that were young and were finding, almost saying, I remember the interview of one guy who was saying, but I, I was not supposed to come and shoot. I was, they told me it was a parade. I was supposed to walk. I was supposed to to just, just come in and, uh, and something like that. So these, these troops were not ready for, were not battle leader troops, were, were not troops that were ready to fight. He really threw in whatever he had because he hoped to do that. Now, having succeeded in uniting all the other, all the, 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 those who were impossible to be united, the Zintani, the Misrati, the, the various triple militia, <coughs> on, on, only this action by, 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 by Haftar could have could have succeeded in, in, in uniting all these forces. Now he has, he has a strong opposition in front of him. And, and the whole country is stuck now in, in, in this military, military conundrum where all the talks that they do about they have to return to the negotiation, the negotiation. there is no military solution. That really surprised me that they still have the courage to say these things. Because what does it mean they have to return to negotiations? What does it mean there is no military solution? 
there is only a military solution for, for the actors right now. Haftar cannot say, okay, I give up. I didn't make it. Uh, sorry, sorry, guys. I, 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 I was joking. Uh, <laughs> let's go back to where, to, to where we were, and let's go back to the Abu Dhabi, the Abu Dhabi meeting, and let's, and let's talk. He, he cannot do that. Can Serraj or any other Western Libya leader sit down in Abu Dhabi with Haftar and discuss a negotiated solution. It's impossible. They will not, they will not do that. So the, the, there is very, very little options here. Either you, I have a problem in saying this, but either you say there and, say, and you tell, okay, let's see how it goes in the end. We, 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 which side will militarily open, win? Or until they reach a, what in negotiation theory is called the hurting stalemate, where they are in such a position where they cannot do it, so they will be forced to to become creative in their negotiator, to come become to, to get to compromise. So you have to let it go. You have to let the situation on the ground continue. You have to, despite the massacres that is going to happen, you have to accept that at the end there will be one loser and one winner, and, and then you can intervene and you can start saying, okay, now you negotiate a conditional surrender or or something like, or something like like that. Or I really don't see much 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 other possibilities. Either the international community is ready to send troops to block the, the fighting, which, way, which they have no intention to do. How, <coughs> how do you bring these actors back to, to, to the negotiating table? It, it is really a difficult question. Moreover, what, what I've noticed when I, when I was there before the attack in Tripoli, talking to my relatives, talking to friends, talking to, that there was a political capital for, for Haftar. I heard many, many, many people think, you know what, these people from the GNA, they are so incompetent, they, 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 they didn't do anything. That let Haftar come in. Let uh, Haftar come, run the country, we will, at least it brings order, we will, we will work. There was some, some exaggerated, maybe, but, but, but some point. With the attack, he did squandered it. He did attack. If one thing I've noticed after the attack was the, top, the total rejection of, of his justification by everybody. There's, there's no reason, no way that, that any Libyan, any inhabitant of Tripoli accept the, the narrative of the Islamists, the narrative of the, of the terrorists, or the sort of stuff. So without that, Haftar has no capital, which means that even if he militarily succeeds in overcoming the resistance of the Misrati and the other troops there, by miracle, he succeeds, he will not be able to hold the city. He, can, he, can, he can, can get the city, but we know beyond. So we will not bring stability that he, that, that he thinks he can bring. He will not bring the, the, the order, the discipline, the, the, the beginning that the, 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 the he's claiming he is doing. So it, it's really a, almost a, a no solution. That's why I, I really react negatively when, when, when I hear the, on, the only statement that the, the, the European Union can make or or France, or either, is that we are with the negotiation. We are, we are, we are the no, you have to then do something. Then you have to either enforce an off-fly zone in the country so that at least you, you, you forbid the utilization of the Air Force against the civilians. Or you have to strongly use all, the, all, all your diplomatic tools to convince the, the, the states, the countries that, that, that are supporting Haftar and, and, and the other side to stay out, to, to, to respect, finally, the United Nations embargo, stop arming one, one or the other of the contenders, and stay out of it. These are the actions that are needed before talking about going back to the negotiations. There are things that have to be applied on the ground, force Haftar to withdraw at least back to, to, the, to a certain number of miles, I don't know, 300 miles, from, I don't know what the, the military experts talk about go back to that position, and then you can start negotiating. Whether, whether, whether it, will, it will be Haftar or someone else in his place, that, 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 that remains to be seen. Another, but another to, add, to add to the difficulty, and another, another thing that I've noticed is that anyway, this anti-Haftar sentiment did not translate into a pro-GNA feeling. It's not, it's not. There, is, there, is, there is an issue there too. 
even if the other side, the militias in Tripoli and the military, win and defeat Haftar and push him, up, push him down, there is, there's going to be a problem there because the Misrati now are in Tripoli. You will not be easily push them out because they help you win. The militias are those who won. Therefore, you are not going to get rid of them. So the whole situation that was evolving before where they were slowly, slowly being pushed out, slowly, slowly being, being, being limited in their role, that, that also ha has gone. So they, they won, so they are going to be there. It's, it, it's really a situation where I, I have a hard time seeing a positive outcome that would allow us to think, to think that, OK, there is light at the end of the tunnel, and it's something that we can work for, and we can okay. it, it takes a, a lot of effort, a lot of goodwill of the Libyans, but a lot of effort from the international community to reestablish a situation of, 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 a, of equilibrium where they can work for a peaceful negotiation. Thank you, uh, Karim. And now we uh, go ahead. <laughs> Najla, is there light at the end of the tunnel? What do you think? <laughs> is it a train heading <laughs> toward us? Well, uh, first of all, thank you um, for the Arabic Center for hosting us today and for all the audience and the speakers and the mediator. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a very good question, and uh, there is hope, yes. There is always hope. Uh, Libya go very, very critical stage today, and uh, the current situation is very... Uh, in clear, uh, uh, it's hard to analyze or define because all these different factors and actors who who's coming up, you know, uh, in the in the screen. However, uh, all the time we neglect the roots of those conflicts, right? So the big question: Why the Libyans fight each other today? What is their motivation? Thinking about this a little bit and going back to the history of Libya, uh, again, there is different factors, different symptoms, uh, and uh, one of them, it's uh, a long history of colonization. Uh, we don't talk about just the Italian, but also uh, the Turkish Empire, and Libya has been for a long time under the colonization. And then the, l the short time of the, the kingdom was that the bright, bright time of Libya where things start established a little bit, even under, you know, uh, definitely uh, the supervision of uh, uh, external countries. However, there was some plan and hope that the countries can establish, you know, a state. Then the dictatorship of Gaddafi for more than 42 years. So there is a big, you know, uh, here uh, a major issue. It comes with the grievances of the Libyans people of itself. You know, people have been struggled with the uh, trust issues, with uh, leaders who are not capable to handle the country, uh, no st a strong institution that can ha also capable to handle the transition, like, for example, the military uh, in Egypt. Whatever, you know, whatever the, our perspective about it, but there is an institution that can, you know, fill the gap where this transition happening. But in Libya, we don't have capable institution we don't have police sector that would able actually to help the civilians while this crisis is coming. We have borders open. Libya is, is a large country where the Sahara actually is the field of uh, you know, smuggling and trafficking. So there is plenty of uh, things happening in the country while the people are happy with the revolution. Uh, and I was there during the revolution in the early days in the, f the first and the second year. It was, the, it was the euphoria of the Libyan. We were so hopeful, we were so happy, and we are optimistic about the future. But there is something wrong happening behind the scene where uh, the, the citizen, the, the simple Libyan people, they cannot actually understand it. Because there is you know, symptoms, and there is uh, influence, and there is history, and there is a lot of stuff happening uh, while the revolution it was happening. So uh, again, when we talk about the, the peace treaties in Libya, the UN mission, you talk about the UN, that's fine, thank you. You talk about the UN mediation and you talk about uh, where is Libya is heading as, as, as a question. Uh, well, the UN mediation, from my perspective, 
its uh, illegitimate body in Libya. Why? Again, because there is a history of the UN in Libya since the UN started. There is no indicator that the UN has been helpful in the situation in Libya. So why I trust the UN? For me, UN is an institution. It's not about Zafasam Salama or somebody else. There is people there working behind that person who actually can contribute to the peace process. So again, the UN, it's not because it's uh, it's an uh, external body, from my perspective, because there is no legitimacy, there is no trust, and there is no way to collaborate with it in an efficient way. Uh, people, when they see the picture of the UN representative in the TV, and, uh, and they see the people how, who represent the Libyan in that, in, that, in that meeting, they don't even want to, s to continue to see the meeting. Why? The question mark, because nobody in the room actually represents the people or they agree with. And I know it's hard, you know, the election process itself and, you know, the appointed and all these different bodies who are now responsible for the country, even the, the, the uh, GNC or the, the parliament or even Hefter or all these different actors. Um, so from <coughs> my perspective, there is a lot happening, you know, within the Libyan people. And when we hear about Oslo, meeting or like Palermo in Italy or whatever, all these meetings, I wish all the money that has been spent in those meetings, inviting people in those fancy places and have conversation and include some people uh, and give them more power in that negotiation table instead of bringing somebody else who can contribute to the peace processes in Libya, well that for me, there is no uh, hope if we can keep taking into that direction. But if we look to the structure of Libya and try to reinstructure the peace process, <coughs> redesign the peace process in Libya, where we include locals, organizations, uh, religious tribal leaders, civil society, uh, police sector, uh, you know, all these different uh, type of uh, Libyan society to be included in that process, I think we're going to see more hopeful uh, outcomes. Uh, again. Uh, I think also there is uh, hope if we think about, about what, what we can do, right? Uh, and maybe that could, could be early for some people, but for me, as a beginning, the leadership aspect of Libya. We don't have capable leadership since the revolution started. We keep have different faces, but we have the same mentality. We have the same system. We have the same way we think about the future of Libya. We need capable leadership. They can handle this crisis. Never Hefter, uh, Sarraj, Parliament, all of them, they have been failed to bring the people together. Well, what's the alternative? The alternative to try to think about other leaders who can actually you know, help the people to grab, grab themselves from this vacuum and try to create mechanism. How this will look like, I don't know, but the leadership aspect is a huge now in Libya. Nobody, nobody respect anyone, nobody listen to anyone. However, Hefter actually, to, to, to speak to the other side of the country, in the east side, where I come from, he's a hero. Libya of Benghazi and the east, they support Hefter because he was the only solution, you know, to secure the city. I have my family, my friends, my relatives, they have been struggling every single day in Benghazi for more than three years since the death of Chris, uh, Chris Stevens because of the extremism. Okay, li people, they, they don't care about what's going on, if he's, he, what's he's want to do, the leader or whatever. He say, we are fine, as long as we are secure to walk in our streets without any threat or any pressure. So we need to think also about the people, right? Needs, safety, security, you know, sense of uh, dignity, all that stuff it never happens. You know, uh, I have relatives, I have friends, they have been guarding in their, in their, in their backyard. You know, we have been attacked, bullet in their hand. Why? Because of militia, group, or whatever. I mean, people have been suffering every single day in their routine. So what's the alternative? After the leadership, from my perspective, trauma, healing. Most of the people, especially, I don't want to say all the people traumatized, but I will say when you have grievances and you don't have the space to talk about those grievances, Injustice during Gaddafi, after Gaddafi, the war, most of the Libyan's youth witness even the violence or have been part of that violence. The blood, the fighting everywhere. 
the language of violence have been used as, as, as alternative for peace because this is the only way to get my rights. Nobody can protect me. So how we can break the cycle of violence? We need to have a space of conversation and real dialogue and listen to the people needs in order for us to shift this mechanism of Libya. Well, the other thing also we need in order to make the transitional um, you know, period of Libya <coughs> go in very smooth way, actually we need to include institutions and also individuals to be part of that uh, mechanism as you know, uh, transitional justice or restorative <coughs> justice. This is a long conversation, but those some of the methods or the tools that can be used within the society uh, you know, um, effort. And the last thing is police and justice reform. We need actually to work in this. Uh, I used to be a lawyer for a long time in Libya, and when I decided actually to you know, uh, leave the law, uh, the reason because the law system has been really corrected, corrupted over the years during the Gaddafi regime. So also the reputation of the law, the reputation who represent the law, and who represent the government, actually it's, it's, it's really huge uh, when it comes to the Libyan crisis. The last thing before I take time is one of the things that most of the people can't maybe, if they don't live in Libya, you don't understand that, that Gaddafi played very well in, in, in you know, uh, messing up with the Libyan identity. You know, so <coughs> even when we, we were studying the school there, he changed all the curriculums. He tried to create his own narrative about who's Libyans, you know, and, you know, try to cut off all the history of, uh, you know, uh, Omar al-Mukhtar and, you know, all the heroes that we feel, you know, honored and proud and, and the kingdom era and all the people have been, uh, been, been part of the Libyan history. So he creates fragile generation. If I didn't know that was from my grandfather or my father, I would never know the history of my country. So when you have generation in 18 and 19 and 20, they fight in either in the military side, no, or in the militia. Actually, they are kids. They don't even know what they're fighting about. I saw a video that day in YouTube. There is a, there is a group of uh, people who, a uh, group of uh, youth, they are fighting with Hefter. They are 18, 19, 20. They are playing video games. And one of them make a comment, say, hey, I want to learn the tactics of the war through this game. I was like really tearing up when I saw that video. How easy to manipulate the minds of youth and make people Libyans fight each other because of what? Because of what? We are Libyans. Either Hefter or not Hefter, militias, all of them Libyans. They used to be neighbors, cousins, friends. You know, we belong to the same country. So also, uh, I will leave the part of external uh, influence, but I will blame <coughs> Libyan first before anything else. 80% as a Libyan, we own this. We have to have the sense of uh, agency we need to do this by ourselves. We need to fix our problems. We need to take care of our, our uh, uh, social capital, social cohesion, because it has been really damaged during the war. And we need really to look very seriously about creating uh, local leadership that can be able to carry out the country uh, with uh, international support. Thank you, Najla, Thank you. very much. Yeah. <laughs> So this is the hope, what I'm saying. <laughs> there, there is a note of hope. It there is a note of hope. <laughs> well, uh, well, hope needs wo hard work. All right, Christian, take us to the regional uh, dimension of this conflict. Uh, is regional politics part of the problem or part of the solution at this stage? <laughs> well, thank you. We just heard very eloquently a cry for local solutions. And I think a big part of the problem as to where we got to from 2011 until here has precisely been the issue of the regionalization of some of the tensions we've seen in other parts of the Middle East, the way they've been played out, not only in Libya, but also in other parts of, of North Africa and elsewhere, and the ways in which uh, actors have intervened without that local knowledge, without that level of local participation in support of top-down agendas and driven by external priorities. And now clearly we had a, a manifestation of that in 2011 and 2012 at that crucial time when everything was in play. We had participants in the no-fly zone, in participants in the kind of coalition to uh, 
assist in the toppling of the Gaddafi regime, you know, pulling in different directions almost straight away. And doing so, I think, in a condition, in the circumstances of having to make decisions very quickly in a rapidly uh, fluid situation, changing very quickly without really knowing who they were empowering and who they were working with, or having a sort of plan B, plan C, or even a set of outcomes that they were hoping to, uh, to, uh, to achieve. And this was happening on both sides of the, of the equation. And I think it definitely led to the proliferation of militias, to the proliferation of political agendas, and absolutely widened the, uh, the gaps at that formative early stage when uh, kind of a consensus on the way forward was, was probably most necessary and it wasn't there. Whereas I think the Qataris, to some extent, have rec recognized and pulled back from that early phase that uh, they were sort of in over their depth. We have, I think, as we all know, seen the UAE continue to push uh, their preferred uh, candidate, Khalifa Haftar, together with others in Egypt, in Russia, in France, very strongly. We remember the 2014 uh, episode of the uh, airstrikes um, remember the uh, violation of various UN arms uh, embargoes, uh, the sort of revelation that the UN Special Envoy Bernardino Leon was simultaneously negotiating to head up the Emirates Diplomatic Academy at the same time as he was trying to sort of work towards a political solution. So we've had a, a long history, I think, of the UAE continuing to view in their mind uh, the situation in Libya as being part of this region-wide attempt to restore or order, restore a form of sort of anti-Islamist control across the region. Not just, we're seeing that in Libya, we're now seeing it in Sudan, uh, we're seeing it in Yemen, of course, over the past several years. It's just kind of continuation of, in their view, a region-wide campaign. And it's really creating, I think, a lot of potential difficulties, partly because of capacity. I mean, we're talking to Ye Yemen, Sudan, Libya, other parts of the Middle East as well. But I think it also potentially blows back on sponsoring countries and picking up on what Karim said. I mean, if people in Abu Dhabi think they can control Khalifa Haftar as a proxy, I think that could be some sort of rude awakening coming up. Um, Khalifa Haftar, once he's in power, if he's in power, will, not, you know, will act on what he thinks is best for his own interests. So I'm th I think anyone getting involved in, in this sort of attempt to try and sort of play proxies against each other is, is, is taking a short-term uh, bet with their very risky long-term consequences. And I think what's been interesting over the past two months since the beginning of the uh, latest offensive is just how sensitive one it has seemed in, well, especially here in Washington, where the UAE is, I think, trying to keep a very low profile um, perhaps encouraging the view that it's Saudi-led or the Russian and Egypt are involved as well, partly because I think it, uh, you know, if you analyze it in one way, yes, it's perhaps part of the UAE campaign to try and crack down against what they see as a, is Islamization of the Middle East and North Africa, but it's also in the Libyan context working against a UN-sponsored uh, political process. And people don't necessarily want to be associating the UAE with working against UN and international community agreements, especially in the UAE, they would not want that to be an association. So you do see a very careful, cautious um, move, I think, to not be seen to be too associated too publicly with these moves, almost to try and give a plausible deniability if it goes wrong. Because I think, as was, again, what was said in the pre previous two interventions, I mean, just how far is Khalifa Haftar willing to go um, given that uh, he was maybe hoping for a quick success, well, it's been six weeks, we've now seen, A, the military solution not working as he'd hoped, and B, we've seen you know, shelling of civilian areas, uh, you know, kind of the use of a very unpleasant tactics of war. I mean, how far is Haftar willing to go to try and pursue, to, to pursue what he wants? And how far does that put the UAE or other backers in a position where they're willing to back him no matter what? I mean, uh, we remember, of course, how... Uh, Benghazi in 2011, where, you know, we saw the no-fly zone come together on humanitarian impulse. And to what extent uh, are we willing, or is the UAE or other backers willing to uh, sort of back Haftar to the absolute limit should Haftar decide to go down that road? I think that's something to 
that they may have to begin to take into account if and when the condition continues to deteriorate. Um, I'll just maybe say a little bit about uh, just a few other external settings in the sense that given that there are three or perhaps four strong external supporters for Haftar, you know, he has had emphasis and momentum and I think partly because we've seen so many of the other principal actors in the international community who would otherwise perhaps expect to be engaged, we've seen them distracted and split. Obviously we see the European Union split between the French and the Italians on the one side, oh, I mean it's going to be one dimension, on different sides. But for example the UK is totally distracted by Brexit, has also very awkward memories of its own intervention in 2011, which actually was the subject of a very damning parliamentary report about David Cameron's uh, conduct of that intervention in 2016. So there's no real appetite for getting too closely involved. I think it really has it really hamstrung the European Union. And then, of course, we've had the uh, extraordinary spectacle of the Trump administration repeating some of the uh, surprises that we've seen over the past two years, where what we think of as sort of settled US interests can suddenly get upended by a presidential uh, statement or, or, or tweet. When I saw the, the, the sort of report about the <coughs> president's conversation with Haftar, first of all, I think it was quite interesting that it only came out about three days later. So in a sense, what were they sort of sitting on and why was someone not releasing it earlier? But um, my, my mind went back to the beginning of the blockade of Qatar in 2017, when again we saw a statement from the president that really threw what we thought was US sort of interest on its head. And perhaps I'd say that just not just on Libya, but perhaps on other events currently taking place you know, vis a vis Iran, we're seeing a much more unbound, sort of personalized set of interest guiding policy making at the very highest level. Whereas at least in 2017, with the blockade, you had a Secretary of State and a Secretary of Defense who were able to push back quite strongly and quickly as well to sort of rebalance US policy to what we thought it was. And I just don't see we necessarily have that here in this situation, which I think makes it more fluid. Obviously, we've seen the president perhaps having a liking for strong men. We've even seen Viktor Orban in DC this week. CC, of course, was uh, may or may not have been the uh, sort of guiding hand for the sudden willingness to try and designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. And uh, one can imagine that uh, Haftar's backers in DC will be casting him as, uh, as the only person that can actually restore order to a country that's had very little of it for the last eight years. And so that agenda perhaps will appeal to a president who has the kind of lack of that specialist knowledge and the people around him as well. So I think, unfortunately, we're, we're probably seeing a lot more of this in the coming weeks and months where settled policy once again is up in the air. There were multiple and competing agendas at play, not a pursuit of the same side or the same objectives. And so those same trends that we've seen really tearing apart and kind of magnifying those differences domestically, I suspect are going to continue. But um, for me, the question will be if Haftar really goes all out, you know, what does that do for his external backers? How far are they willing to go in support of that? Thank you, Christian. Uh, last but not least, uh, Federica uh, Fasonatnotti uh, joining us from uh, Milano, uh, Italy, on uh, Skype. And uh, thank you for your patience. I hope you were able uh, to hear the presentations thus far, but yes. we're anxious uh, to hear your assessment of the European uh, role and your comments also on the U.S. role in, in Libya. Please, the microphone is yours. Okay, thank you very much, first of all, for this invitation. And uh, I, I am very happy to, to be with you and to hear uh, another time that all uh, the scholars uh, um, that are interested in Libya are on the same, uh, uh, on the same part. Yesterday, there was an important uh, hearing at the Congress of the United States uh, on Libya. And it was amazing seeing friends uh, and colleagues uh, all uh, like, uh, you know, like a wall. 
um, the the movement on of, of Aftar has been uh, really a stupid move, in my opinion. And uh, but the point is that Aftar is the result of. Uh, um, all these external uh, uh, interventions that we have seen uh, and that uh, my colleagues just uh, touched. Um, so uh, let's say that uh, the first uh, the first thing that we have to answer the first question is why Libyans permitted, uh, as Dr. Um, Mangush said before, why Libyans permitted. Uh, uh, all these external interventions in the country. And uh, she gave the right answer in many respects. So uh, Libyans were no uh, used to uh, decide for themselves because of the colonization and uh, because of, of course, Gaddafi after that. And, um, and so the country at the time of the revolution uh, that became uh, almost immediately a civil war, so that had many differences uh, uh, compared to other uh, countries in the Arab Spring, um, was not prepared to, uh, to govern itself in, in many respects. And so permitted to external actors in three, let's say, different layers uh, so one local, uh, one uh, uh, regional, and one, let's say, international, um, to, to act inside the country and to spoil uh, what I always say, and Karim knows this very well, uh, the natural process of uh, political selection. It's a very um, simple and Darwinian uh, idea, this one, but it's very effective. So um, all these different in intrusions uh, had, had really spoiled the capacity and the possibility to have a natural leadership from Libya in many, in many respects. And, um, and Aftar is a result, as I was telling you, uh, of this uh, uh, spoiling vortex. Uh, because without the help of uh, uh, the United Emirates, Arab Emirates, or without the help uh, of Russia or Egypt, I really um, have to, I mean, it's very difficult to think him to be at this point. Um, you asked me about uh, France, uh, Italy, and the United States. Uh, well, let's say that um, these three uh, countries are part of the, the international uh, level of uh, in, in intrusion in Libya. Unfortunately, at this point, the United States are uh, away and we are waiting for them. And uh, let's hope that President Trump will change uh, his way of behaving. And um, about uh, uh, France and Italy, what I can tell you is that uh, they have the same target in the end that are substantially three at this point. So one is migration, the other one is <laughs> energy, and the other one is terrorism. Uh, but they have completely an opposite way to uh, manage them. And so that's the, the point of crash between uh, Italy and uh, France. Uh, the rivalry and the competition uh, between the two countries has always been on plate uh, since the time of the slap, slap of Tunis and uh, the end of 19th century. So it, there is nothing new here. But of course, uh, um, this kind of, kind of rivalry is not helping Libya uh, in the end, as usual, uh, because on uh, Libya is becoming again like for Qatar and Turkey, um, a, a proxy, it, let's say a terrain of uh, a proxy war. Um, at this point, uh, when you talk with uh, the diplomats, uh, Italian and French, they say usually that the relationship between France and Italy about Libya is perfect, is wonderful. But one point, uh, I believe them, I believe uh, 
the diplomats, so I believe that they are trying to do their best uh, to find a solution uh, in managing uh, the relationship with Libya. But in the end, there is another actor here, uh, and uh, a group of actors, let's say. And this group is made by politicians. And so when you have Macron and when you have, for example, Salvini or Di Maio, our prime minister, our minister of interior and the minister of labor, um, putting themselves in, in a condition of crash with, uh, with Macron, it's evident that every other um, political solution will be impossible between France and Italy in general uh, in Europe, mm -hmm. and you can imagine in Libya. Uh, as far, um, so th this is the situation right now. Nothing is solved between the two countries, and in my opinion, and not because I'm Italian, we have uh, our huge uh, sins in Libya, and they belong for the majority to the history. But uh, let's say that the, the, the way of managing uh, the relationship with Libya by France has been really wrong and uh, has demonstrated, in my opinion, as a historian now I'm talking, a completely no knowledge of, uh, of the country. So I think that politicians should start to study history, study social and uh, uh, tribal uh, dynamics uh, uh, when they go in countries like, uh, like Libya, for example. And the idea that democracy can be taken in just a few months is absolutely crazy. Democracy needs a lot, a lot of years and efforts and uh, uh, strength from, uh, first of all, uh, the people who, wants, who want to have democracy. So in this case, Libyans. Libyans must be really motivated to have democracy because democracy has a very high price to pay, as we know in the United States and in Europe and so on. We have fought uh, and we, we, I mean, we pay for, with blood uh, for democracy. So um, the United States now is the huge uh, missing in action and uh, and uh, unfortunately there is uh, as usual in this uh, in this administration no uh, clarity so uh, secretary pompeo says something and uh, after that uh, uh, mr trump says a completely different thing so i think that the united states should play in this uh, situation right now with Aftar in front of tripoli important and decisive uh, uh, role. But the point is that, uh, as uh, Trump said uh, in uh, April uh, 2017, during a, a meeting with our former prime minister, Mr. Gentiloni, uh, he was not interested in Libya at all, just because, and if it was just because of, uh, uh, of a problem uh, of terrorism. And so, uh, what can you expect in this way? I, I hope that he will change his mind, and I hope that this administration will be able to make uh, change in his mind. But it's very, it's very difficult at this moment. I, th I think. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. There are cards on your seats uh, or the seat in front of you. Uh, please indicate your name, your affiliation and uh, ask your question or write your question clearly. We'll be glad to collect those. Just raise your hand when your question is ready. Staff will pick him up and bring him up here for us uh, to read. But what I mean by the Americanization of this crisis is maybe out of fear for what uh, Federica just mentioned. Both parties in, in Libya all of a sudden seem to be concerned about getting their point of view across in Washington. Uh, they don't want to be left out. Uh, I noticed from uh, or heard from several friends in the lobbying community that they have been approached by both sides to lobby for this side and that side uh, in Libya. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the government in Tripoli already hired uh, Mercury uh, to do that uh, at, uh, I don't know, rumored uh, price of uh, maybe 100000 uh, a month. Uh, but also the other side is consulting with several other 
uh, firms uh, trying to uh, sign a deal soon uh, to also get their point of view across. Would any of you care to comment on this new kind of development? Uh, would that ease the search for a solution to the conflict? Would that speed up maybe better American understanding of the conflict? Or would that add insult to injury? Go ahead. Not only one side looks for it, but within the same side, there are different sides who look for different lobbies. Yes. So, as we know, this is not a recipe for success. Lobbying is something that should be done, as some of the other Arab countries very well show us. It's something you go for years. It's something you have a plan to present your government, your size, your, 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 your narrative, your version. You hire a lobby, and they will prepare a campaign for you. Now, hiring a lobby and uh, demanding that in two weeks they create for you a whole new narrative, a whole new position, it's, it's, it's really asking for, for the impossible. Better late than, than never, <laughs> maybe, but still I have my doubts that it, it would be a game changer. The, the, the reality is that in Washington there is the structure, the institutions who, who are more, more careful to what is going on, rather than the presidency that is a little bit <coughs> on, the, on the superficial way. So how, the, how that can be affected by lobbyists is it, it, an unknown. Yeah. Federica would like to comment on, on that? Or? No, I, I agree. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, connected to the point I was telling before. Uh, it's impossible to have uh, a, a process of uh, uh, political selection in uh, two weeks, in one month. I mean, uh, uh, people must be really motivated and targeted to that. So I think that, well, less, better late than never, but it's not enough. Anybody else uh, on this issue? I mean, we've seen with the Gulf crisis that hiring lobbyists just polarizes and doesn't necessarily shift opinions massively either way, it just reinforces the two different sides of the narrative and uh, I expect that maybe what will happen here as well. Well for me, uh, two parts or even like six or seven, they are like, you know, uh, d d divided from the original parts. All of them, they represent themselves and their own agenda. So no nobody speak about the people, uh, nobody speak about the Libyans. So. Okay, thank you. We have uh, uh, one question regarding the uh, Islamic uh, movement, if you will, in, uh, in Libya. Having spent uh, you know, several years uh, of uh, dominating uh, the political scene uh, in Libya, isn't it time now for the Libyan people to pursue a more secular uh, regime uh, to, to try to kind of avoid ISIS returning? or taking over a larger chunk of the country? Well, uh, if may I ask? Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, from my perspective, again, I think there is the problem. We have two things here when we talk about Islam or secularism or like extremism or whatever. We have the first thing is Libya is not ready for democracy for me. And, uh, you know, Pushing a lot of countries who are going through transition to jump to the democracy stage is a huge mistake. And Libya, one of the examples. For example, the election was one of the successful election process in Libya that happens in 2012. I witnessed that. It was amazing <coughs> compared to country go through war and after dictatorship. But the problem is not the election itself. The problem, the result of this election and the foundation that can support that democracy. We don't have it. We don't have, democracy is a culture. Before we impose democracy as a system or as a you know, goal, it's a culture. It is the way we think about our future, the way how we can live together, the way how we can communicate. We don't have this yet. We are not ready for this yet. So when we talk about Islamist or secularism, or from my perspective, why we don't uh, open the space for everyone to be included in the conversation when it comes to Libya? Why we don't have Islamists, secular, 
whatever, you know, who are extreme in the way they look to Islami, Wasati, yeah. who are, you know, uh, moderate people, without actually having, when we have parties and have people who have different way of thinking about the country or the state, that's healthy for me. There is no problem with that. But if you want to impose it as, as a way to lead the country, then this is the problem here. So I think, I, I think when it comes to secularism, and it's, there's an, uh, again, it's very, tricky subject because when you don't have people are educated about their rights and the way and the future of their country will be so hard for you to ask them this question if you want secular or Islam or whatever. They need to understand first how this will be implemented in their future and then from there you can uh, uh, you know think about this. But again you know I think it should be the conversation open to everyone to be included without putting them in different category because all of them they are Libyans and we have to learn democracy right to include everyone if we want to learn democracy right we need to include everyone in, uh, you know in the picture uh, thank you we have a question from Kimberly Dvorak I'd like to direct that question uh, uh, let's say to Federica this one reg regarding US diplomacy since you brought that up and and, and uh, uh, recommended that the U.S. Uh, should be involved a little bit more. What kind of U.S. Di diplomacy would be helpful at this time? Well, I think uh, that we could have uh, uh, two points. Uh, the United States could uh, act uh, uh, towards two paths. Uh, one, uh, let's say, internal to Libya. Uh, and so trying to moderate uh, uh, the tensions and the frictions that there are now on plate uh, in the country. So between the two parties, let's say, the GNA and the HOR and more Aftar. Um, so acting there, because uh, American diplomats can do uh, very good jobs in, in sometimes. I mean, so they are very good and they can push with all the weight of the United States uh, uh, on the ground. And on the other side, of course, the role of the United States, uh, that has been so uh, away at the corner in all these years of post-revolution, um, could be very uh, important in trying to manage all the frictions and the tensions that there are on, uh, let's say, an international and regional uh, level. And layer, so uh, the tensions uh, and the, the different way of uh, acting in Libya, of Qatar and the Emirates and Saudi Arabia, for example, and Turkey on the other side, or uh, between France and Italy. Because believe me, if uh, if the United States uh, speaks uh, with a strong voice, uh, both Italy and France will listen to it for sure. So I think that the, the role could be really, um, really important and effective uh, in, diploma in diplomatic terms and um, also asking for a ceasefire, for example, in this very moment, but asking in a strong way. And uh, I think that for Aftar, just, uh, uh, I, I wrote an article uh, a month ago uh, on uh, the Brookings site, and I and I wrote something really strong, uh, uh, telling that even in a practical way, even uh, putting a, a, a vessel, a military vessel, in front of the port of Tripoli, just an American one, of course, just in order to make a start to understand that things have changed, I think that could be useful. Okay, any other comments on this, or should we proceed to the next? Well, one thing I think sure. is also very helpful when it comes to diplomacy, I will add it uh, to Federica, what she's saying, that beside the conversation of diplomacy, we have also the incentives, right? The incentives, they can use incentive when you say strong way, with those external outsider, you know, sure. either Arabs or non-Arabs. You know, uh, right. if you said, uh, as United States, don't intervene in the business of Libya or whatever, definitely will be heard, you know, and, and that actually also can uh, decrease the influence now uh, in the situation in Tripoli and maybe now create space for uh, Libyans or even with some local leaders to think about the future of their country. But with, with this pressure, definitely would be so hard. 
Okay. Uh, related to this question of uh, U.S. policy and U.S. understanding uh, of the conflict and the personalities involved, I, I, um, I would like to ask a question myself. Uh, I learned the past couple of days that Amnesty International and other organizations have been agitating for actually some legal action uh, based on the fact that the recent fighting uh, by uh, uh, Khalifa's, uh, Haftar's uh, troops uh, have uh, contributed or caused uh, at least 400 people being killed and 2,000 uh, wounded in addition to what, uh, what we have seen uh, in, uh, in the past. And therefore, they are suggesting that since Haftar carries an American citizenship, uh, he is subject to U.S. laws. Uh, should that uh, type of legal action be pursued, do you think that will impact uh, U.S. attitude toward what's going on in Libya, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Haftar? Of course. Yeah, go ahead, Federica. I'm sorry. Yesterday, for example, the hearing at the Congress uh, finished with the congressman telling, I'm going to uh, organize a group of congressmen asking for uh, a, an intervention in this way, as you were saying, against Aftar for, you know, uh, all the war crimes and, uh, you know, in general crimes uh, against humanity he did. So uh, something is moving. Uh, I'm uh, hopeful in this way. Karim? Yeah, it will be very important. It's, it's the, one, the first yeah. thing that, that, that Sarah should have done, do yeah. what Sarkozy did for Gaddafi. Go to the Supreme to the court and, and, and defer Hafter as a, as, a, as a war criminal and have them investigate and taint him with this with this accusation. That, that would be interesting. A very good strategic point. Yeah. Okay. We have a question from uh, Marcus from uh, Georgetown University about the uh, massive cost uh, of this conflict, uh, hundreds of millions. Uh, of dollars to sustain uh, the fighting. Where is this money coming from uh, to keep this war going on? Well, if each of the parties has external backing, or one of the parties has multiple external backers, it's probably quite likely that in, in Haftar's case, he's received uh, at least multiple offers of support uh, from various patrons in other Arab and capitals and capitals further afield and, <coughs> and you know, just, let's also remember that Haftar did a tour of uh, Abu Dhabi Riyadh and I think he was in Moscow now I don't know exactly what details he was up to in each capital but it does seem as if there was a degree of uh, a degree of sort of bringing everyone on side before he launched the latest uh, offensive and so I'm quite sure that there's something in that and then, of course, Libya, unfortunately, you know, has been plundered over the past eight years. And you know, control of territory means control of resources as well. And uh, we see that, I think, playing out. All right. Uh, we have a question from uh, Giorgio Cafiero uh, regarding Islamic State. How has Islamic State looked at or seen Haftar's offensive in Tripoli? It's a blessing. <laughs> yes, I agree. They, yeah. they, the fact that the militias were in Tripoli trying to find out where the sleeping cells were uh, and taking away, now they are, are, are forced to fight against Haftar's army, have left the whole, the, whole, uh, the whole field open. So they can take advantage of the lack of attention, lack of security, to move, to reform, to, to, to get armed. So I really believe that for them it's been. Uh, the other part of George's, I think you touched on it, the uh, question is, have the extremists indeed uh, sought to capitalize on the heating up of, of the crisis as a result? Yes, I believe so. Also because the, the weakening of the state has is, 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 is always been one, one, one of the purposes of terrorists. So yes. if they can play the cleavages that exist between, within society, as ISIS has done in Syria very well, that's for them, it's, 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 it's. But let me just add sure. something. If we back up a little bit, you know, like now we are focusing, you know, in Haftar and what's going on. But okay, why Haftar come to Tripoli? Why he uh, initiated also the Dignity Movement in Benghazi? 
What's the reason behind that? It was safe, it was heaven. I mean, even Tripoli, every day, every day people kidnap. Every day people, uh, you know, uh, even killed or whatever for any reasons. Uh, what's going on there? I mean, who's, who's in charge? If Sarraj is not capable to handle the country, and I'm not saying the violence or the war is the answer. I'm, not, I'm justifying here, Hector, but I'm saying there is a problem also there, right? It's, it's not just we, are, we were uh, you know, in heaven and then Hefter came. Well, we have something. Makes this vacuum more, you know, more uh, dangerous. So Saraj actually, in one of the conversations, he gave the light to Hefter to come to Tripoli. He said, if you can help us in the, you know, uh, to get rid of the militias groups there. But then he back up in his conversation because he felt, oh, what I did, you know, he, he thought that this is the green light to, to start the, to start initiate this war. So we, we need also actually to have the, the holistic picture of that. You know, why he's acting based on what? He's, who's, who's there actually? Who's, who's fighting? Who's fighting who? You know, and where's those people? And, and those people have been manipulated and feeded by who? If really we need to analyze the, the picture well, we need to identify also there's a human rights violation from the other side as well. There is civilians have been killed in this uh, other side as well. And all of them, they are Libyans. And even if there's some others who, who, who fed that or you know, uh, led those groups. So again, we, we talk about Hefter as, 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 a, as a moment, as a current crisis, but also if Hefter is not in the screen now in Tripoli, is Tripoli safe? No. It, 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 we need also to think about this. I'm just like leaving it, this as a question, I'm not answering it. But also just as a critical analysis, if we want to analyze it in an objective way. Okay, is Ken here? All right, uh, could you, I, I couldn't read yeah, your, your question, but I know it has something to do with uh, France, the ICC. Yeah, it might be a lot. Yeah. In 2011, while uh, France was uh, attacking Libya, I had occasion to ask uh, the French Foreign Minister, Mr. Juppé, Juppé. Yeah. whether he was concerned about being uh, charged by the ICC as a war criminal, uh, as, as Gaddafi had just been. And his response was, uh, let history be the judge. How has history judged Mr. Juppé? Anybody cares to comment on that? It's not on Libya, but it's on Juppé, whatever. Is it? Oh, it's definitely on Libya. I, I, maybe I did, didn't understand. We're talking understand. about, this was during the French attack on Libya. Oh, I see, ah, okay. okay. Yeah. French, American, British, was it? Right, NATO, right. NATO. Uh, official NATO action. Uh -huh. So how history has judged that attack? Or the? His motives, his action, the consequences. I mean, <laughs> It was an attack against the country which wasn't attacking anybody else, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. normally the sort of thing that the ICC might take an interest in. Yeah, but it was masked with the idea of the right to protect. <laughs> it, was, it was hidden behind that idea, which was never their intention. The, the French intention was to get rid of Gaddafi. Well, that, that, okay, that, so that, but that how many civilians they have died during out. that attack? But, so the court, the court wouldn't judge it, but how about history? How about us? Well, but were France, Britain, the United States entitled to attack Libya? They, 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 in they, light of the consequences, especially? They, they would have been entitled if there was the need to, def to protect the citizens. If they had limited that to... See, there's, there's one difference between intervening in a country and looking for, for, the, for the leader of the country in order to kill him, as the French did since the beginning. When, when you remember Gaddafi was <coughs> hidden in, 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 a, in a neighborhood out of Tripoli, and the French they knew because of, of the betrayal of we know whom. So they knew where Gaddafi was and they tried to kill him and they persecuted this, this idea. That, that is different from I intervene to protect the citizens of Benghazi, which I believe that would have been legitimate. If Mr. Haas, President of the Council of Foreign Relations, wrote in an article on the, on the Huffington Post prior uh, to the attack that a massacre was either from a uh, Likely or, uh, I forget what uh, they were, uh, prominent, uh, no, no, eminent, eminent, thank you, uh, if, <laughs> which would negate 
the R2P uh, rationale, but even given that, <coughs> suppose if that was in fact NATO's intention, did they succeed? Haven't many more Libyans been killed as a result of that action? Than would but have no, been? but no, because they didn't stop the right to protect. Because they continued until the, that. That is the, the, the issue. Is not if they had limited to stop the Khalid al Warfali troops who were who, who were moving to to, to Tripoli. If they stopped to Benghazi, stopped him, and then said, "Now you solve the situation among you." That would, would, would have been one legitimate but it position. But would never happen like this. No, no. Like know, if they want to intervene, they need to continue. This is yeah. like the, the price that we have to pay for it. But as, as a locals, during that time, I was there when the tanks was coming to Benghazi. The, the Sarkozy, when he gave the right <coughs> for that intervention, it was, he saved many lives in Benghazi. I was one of them. I was, uh, we, we were living in the neighborhood uh, from the west side, where the tanks was coming, interfering Benghazi, and we decided, me and my family, to stay in our house. If that day, Sarkozy, he didn't give the order, we will be killed, for sure. So how have we, as, as, as actual decision, as current decision, it saved many lives. What is the consequences for this? and how has been, have been taken, this is other story. But for locals who have been during that time under the attack, he saved them. Okay. As a Libyan, I say that. Yeah. That's One of the issues that uh, was not uh, discussed in detail today is the Libya's wealth. Uh, Libya is one of the world's uh, longest oil producers, largest oil, oil producers, this is from Marcus. Uh, where is the oil money going? Uh, as late as December 2018, uh, the income was more than $200 million per week uh, that went to the National Oil Company. What happened to all that money? I wish I had the answer. Yeah. <laughs> but they go, but they go, as, as, they go as salaries to over 300,000 people. They go into GNC the, Parliament, yeah. all those people, for and, and, the, and the corruption that, that is going on. I just heard like two days ago there is uh, they they open an uh, office in Houston. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, again, I'm wondering where this the income will go and who's gonna. Mm. Yeah. Can I offer a corollary question? Not on something else. Or no, it's related to this. Yeah, go ahead. In addition. Libya's sovereign wealth fund, which is estimated at 90 to 150 billion dollars, is in the hands of Westerners. Yes. Might they be interfering in Libya to see against a resolution of the uh, conflict? Because if, with a stable government in Libya, they would have to give up that control. That's no small amount of money. Yeah, yeah. that's that's very, very true. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that uh, piece of information, uh, I think I, I would like to, first of all, join me in thanking our great panelists for their contribution today.